Hi, for those that don't know me, I'm, I'm David Chu. Um, we're going to spend half an hour or so talking about nerve stimulators. Um, really, it's just a theory of nerve stimulators and a little bit of clinical stuff on how to um, how to get the best out of them. Um, if you look at the history of trying to find nerves, um, the oldest technique, and still occasionally used now, is direct vision. It's probably the most accurate. You, know, you kind of rip open the neck, inspect the brachial plexus, and um, put a load of local anaesthetic in. You know, I still ask surgeons to do it if they can see nerves. You may as well block them. You know, we we put sciatic catheter. We put you know, for um, the amputations, we stick epidural catheters up by the sciatic nerve. Um, you know, the thoracic surgeons have done blocks in the chest for years looking at the nerves directly. Um, then we developed sort of percutaneous techniques where you put a needle through the skin without being able to see. Um, and originally, certainly in the 1940s, 50s and 60s, paresthesia was the way people used to find nerves. Have you ever used paresthesia? Have you ever seen it? It's quite brutal actually. It's quite, it's quite barbaric. What, what you're aiming to do is, is make contact with the nerve. Um, and the big mantra of the 1950s used to be no paresthesia, no anesthesia. If you don't get good going pain, um, you're not going to get much of a block. I, I've never really done much with paresthesia because I, I, I've always used peripheral nerve stimulators. But I, I did work in the South Pacific for a year, um, 20 years ago. And all the guys there were paresthesia experts and you know, brutal but effective. So when they were doing a supraclavicular brachial plexus block, they stabbed the needle onto the first rib, went bang, 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 bang across the first rib until somebody screamed they had pain in their fingers. And then that was it, good, do the block. Um, their blocks were great. Um, what was the incidence of that? Um, <coughs> that one is compared with that one. No one's ever been able to show a huge difference. There was lots of arguing about that when peripheral nerve stimulators came in because the... The basic idea of peripheral nerve stimulator is you get close to it but don't touch the nerve. And intuitively you think there'd be less complications. Um, I'm not aware of any really decent studies. People tried to look at it. The problem is, as we'll come to a, another talk this afternoon, when you've got a complication that's very rare, finding a difference between two techniques is extremely difficult. We're having the same trouble looking at the difference between complications between peripheral nerve stimulators and ultrasound machines. You, you, you're talking about needing 50 to 70,000 patients to be powered enough to detect, you know, um, and what is clinical difference. So paresthesia used to be you know, the technique for locating nerves in the 50s and 60s. It, you know, if you're in the middle of nowhere and you haven't got a nerve stimulator, it's 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 something that you know I would I would resort to. What you're really asking the patient to report is you know, sort of small electric shocks running down their arm or leg, um, and then and then doing a, doing an injection. So this was the sort of percutaneous era. Um, and then we started to try and see under the skin. Um, the chronic pain doctors have been doing this for years. They've been using x-ray and dye and all sorts of things to, to actually look um, and try and get some idea of where their needle tip is before they inject. Um, PEG, which you won't have seen before, was percutaneous electrode guidance. Um, that was probably fashionable about 12, 12 15 years ago. They, what they used to do was put high currents through the skin to try and locate where the nerve was. It's a bit like nerve mapping. Um, you put high currents through the skin as you move a probe over the skin, and when you get the best response, that's where you put your needle through the skin. Um, but obviously, we all now live in the, in the era of, of, of ultrasound. So I'm just going to talk about peripheral nerve stimulators, how they work, and how to get the best out of them. There are still many American anaesthetists who are fond of paresthesia as a technique. And the reason they like it is it's simple. You generally do it in awake patients. Um, and it specifically targets sensory nerves, which is obviously what you want to block in terms of um, pain type blocks. And the same people will tell you if you use PNS technique, um, it's complex. You need kit, you often need a second pair of hands. And a lot of American centers, they, they only have one pair of hands. They don't have ODPs or other assistants. Um, you can do it awake or asleep, um, it's a bit more objective. Um, but the thing about peripheral nerve stimulators is that you need a mixed nerve for it to work. Because what you're doing is you're using motor stimulation as a proxy for, for the location of sensory nerves. Um, the big advantage when it came in was that it was a sort of no-touch technique. 
Um, and as you alluded to, we think it's safer, but we're, we're not sure. Um, the history of these things being developed was anaesthetists who were electronic sort of buffs going home to their garden shed and making up something new during the night and bringing it in. They were actually, they would literally make it up on, over the weekend, bring it in on Monday and try it out on patients. I, you wouldn't get away with it today. But that pioneering period had to happen because the commercial companies weren't interested in uh, making these small electronic devices until the technique had been, had been proven. So there are quite a few pioneers with all sorts of homemade kit that were um, quite painful. A lot of patients experienced quite a lot of pain with the early, early versions of these bits of kit. But you know, any of these location techniques, PNS or paracetamol, is going to have a, a failure rate. And for a peripheral nerve stimulator, 10 to 15 percent is, is probably about middle of the road. You'll find a few people who claim they only have a 5% failure rate. You'll see plenty of papers where the failure rate is worse than 15%. But I think if you looked at all PNS blocks, um, when I think, you know, the sort of late 1990s, you know, I would reckon to have a 10% failure rate. So you know, one in 10 of my blocks just wouldn't work. Um, and that's even with a good looking twitch. You know, I think I've got a nice looking twitch of a sensible current level. Um, and that's where you know the science kind of clashed with the art because you know, when you looked at someone like Martin Herrick working mm -hmm. in the 1990s, um, Martin knew all the science, but he'd also developed the art of getting the best out of his out of his kit. And the problem we've got when we're using peripheral nerve stimulators is that there are a lot of variables to deal with: um, anatomical, physiological, electrical properties of the tissues and the equipment, um, and no two people are the same. Um, and there are lots of reasons why a block that works perfectly well in one person using the kit, you put the same sort of kit, kit in a different patient and you either can't get a twitch or you get a, um, an odd looking twitch and you, get, and you get a block failure. So in terms of clinical stuff, um, how do you do a block? Well, you're going to do checks and get IV access. Um, personally, you know, for a long time I've liked to set up the block looking at the consent form and not put the needle through the skin until I've looked at the mark and I like to be able to see the mark so when you get people covering up patients so you can just see the bit you want to put the needle in I get a bit unhappy about that because it's quite easy to cover up a, a mark on a knee or, or a lower arm or something um, so you do relevant checks and you get your um, IV access um, anyone seen come across a wrong sided block? You know, they happen from time to time. We probably have, what, about one every two years here, Alan? Yeah. yeah, something like that. You know, they happen occasionally. Um, if you do a wrong-sided block, what are you going to do next? Most most patients who've got their family down from Scotland to look after them for their knee replacement uh, are probably going to... I mean, you know, I, I like where you're coming from, but I think most patients would find that unacceptable because they have cleared their lives to have their hemiarthroplasty. That's where we're going to. <laughs> so, if you're doing shoulder surgery, what are you not going to do? I probably wouldn't do any bilateral I think that's probably a fair comment. I mean, you know, I, I, I've known it happen in East Anglia once that a young, fit person had a block on the wrong side for shoulder surgery, and then they were blocked on the correct side which means they lost both their diaphragms and they struggled to breathe for some little while after that. Um, so you're probably going to try and carry on doing the surgery, probably without local. If it's, a, if it's a knee replacement, you might think about doing a block on the correct side. Um, I would talk to the patient about it. If the patient is already asleep and you do the block, you then got to make your choice. You're always going to get on and do the surgery because they're anaesthetised. Um, I probably would block the correct side. Um, 
if I'm happy with the dosing, but that, <coughs> means, that means I can't get the surgeon to infiltrate the needle like I normally do because I'm up to my I'm up to my dose limit. But you know, certainly for brachial plexus blocks, don't block the correct side as well as the wrong side because you know, um, potentially in trouble. You, know, you could have bilateral diaphragmatic paresis or bilateral pneumothoraces, all of which would be fairly embarrassing. Um, so, so don't, so don't go. Okay, next thing is, you know, <coughs> you use a tenth of a millisecond on the machines. Are you, are you used to selecting that variable? Are you played with the machines? Okay. Um, the initial nerve stimulators didn't give a choice. They came preset to 0.1 millisecond impulse duration, and that was it. The more modern ones give you a choice, um, and that's what you want to pick. Generally, if someone is, is either awake or asleep, you're going to start at something like 2 milliamps. In the neck, I'll start with less. I'll start with 1.2 or 1 or something. But you want to start with a reasonable amount of current, um, generally going at about 2 hertz. Um, and if the machine will let you, you want it to display the current that's actually going to the patient, not that's coming out of the machine. So that if you have a problem, it shows up fairly, it shows up fairly quickly. Um, you're going to move fairly slowly. Why are you going to move fairly slowly? In terms of needle speed through the tissue. You've got a two hertz frequency, yeah. so you can move very way, very quickly. Between the, the twitches. I mean, it's like, you know, you're driving a car through a forest at night with the headlights on, trying to miss all the trees. If you make it excited by flashing the headlights on and off, if the headlights can see 50 meters and you're, draw and you're driving at more than 50 meters a second and you're only flashing headlights every second, you could easily crash into a tree that you, um, that you didn't see. So. It's an intermittent way of finding nerve, so you're going to go slowly to take account of that. Um, in terms of how you're going to get a decent block, generally you want to get a decent twitch at about 0.5 milliamps. You'll see lots of people going on about this, you'll see lots of people with their own ideas about what they like. There are plenty of American anesthetists who have got to get 0.3. Um, generally, most of the literature supports getting about 0.5. If you deliberately try and get below 0.5, your chance of getting a better block is very small, and your chance of getting complications starts to shoot up. So if you've got a twitch of 0.5, that's normally going to be okay. Um, and certainly, you know, if you've got a twitch of 0.5, don't go seeking anything lower, because you're likely to cause yourself more trouble. Um, you're going to put in a very small amount of uh, injectate, local anesthetic, um, looking for very low resistance to injection. Um, and you're expecting the twitch to disappear almost as soon as the pressure is applied to, this, to, to the plunger on the syringe. Okay. Um, you'd need to control your ODAs with this. This is the one time I love working with girl ODPs because by nature they're, they're fairly subtle and fairly gentle. Um, some of the, you know, if I get some 6 or 4 ODP who I've never met before, I'm actually quite anxious um, and I'm sure they think I'm mad because I really am taught, I said, I do not want you to give this all your power and strength. I want you to use one thumb and do it very gently. Because if they put the first three or four mils in the wrong place, all the damage is done. Um, so no resistance to injections, twitch should disappear. Um, I just get the ADPs to use a single thumb. It's quite difficult with only one thumb to generate enough pressure to cause um, a lot of damage. It's not impossible, but if you start to use two thumbs or the heel of your hand, you need to kind of say, don't do it like that, just please just use one thumb. I'm actually embarrassed that when Kim Allen did the crib sheet for all the stuff in orthopedic the theatres, she put a picture on the front of one thumb on the syringe. So was, everyone's forgotten about that, that was a few, was a few years ago. So that's because you're worried about sort of direct, no damage. Yeah, I've got a graph in a second that we'll go through with that. But yeah, what you want is a very low resistance to injection. Um, this is the headlines, I'm going to put some of the detail in a second. And then inject the remainder with, with, with precautions. Um, what do I mean by with precaution? Now you're going to put 20 mils in. Aspirate. Yeah. You're going to aspirate. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you want, if the patient's awake, you want them to report two things. Pain or... Yeah. 